Welcome to the Complete Streets Institute webinar series. My name is Holly Medell, and I am the Complete Streets Project Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Community Health, and I will be one of your moderators today. So what are Complete Streets? Well, according to uh, the Michigan Complete Streets legislation that we'll talk about, it's a system of streets that's planned, designed, and constructed to provide appropriate access to all legal users in a manner that promotes safe and efficient movement of people and goods, whether by car, truck, transit, assistive device, foot, or bicycle. The key is a system. This is not talking about a street, but really a complete network in both moving along and across the road. And when we're talking about all different types of users, we are talking about bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, motorists, trucks, children, elderly, people of various abilities. Now, you'll see here kind of a list of buzzwords I think we've probably all heard over the past 10 years. Livable streets, walkable communities, healthy communities, active communities, context-sensitive solutions, safe routes to school, sustainable transportation, traffic calming, active transportation, smart growth. Um, these all share the complete streets idea of making our streets work for all different users. They all contribute to improved safety and healthy choices in a greener lifestyle. So how did we get here? This slide just kind of depicts something we're all familiar with, but back you know, in the 1910s up through the beginning of World War II, um, we became more and more of an automotive-oriented community, but it really was accelerated post-World War II with uh, a lot of federal programs and the real boom in suburbia where we went to lower density, living in the suburbs, curvilinear streets, which now more recent research shows is actually less safe than the old grid streets. So we had a big boom in post-World War II especially in the 50s through the early 70s had a decline in the urban areas, especially major uh, cities like Detroit and to a lesser degree Lansing, certainly Saginaw, Bay City, and, and uh, Jackson, other cities in Michigan. And uh, now we're sort of seeing a, maybe some changes that we've had, a stabilization in suburbia with the economic decline. There seems to be a more of a focus on invigorating some of the urban centers of the past for a number of reasons. And really, the focus of Complete Streets is there's a renewed interest in walking and biking for all its many benefits. Traditional transportation planning really was focused from that era of post-World War II on improving mobility for automobiles and trucks and also safety. And so the whole transportation system was set out looking at what is the, where's the congestion, how do we best accommodate vehicle travel and make it more faster, more convenient and safer for people to drive from one place to another. And the new thinking is really looking at all the different users. Again, the complete streets concept. So we're still looking at automobiles and trucks and commerce. We're not forgetting about that, but we're paying more attention to other ways people get around, transit, walking, biking. And a couple of tips on this is, our, I guess, our philosophy is uh, while the goal is that each street would be complete, so each street would be comfortable and inviting and usable for pedestrians, bicyclists, automobile users, trucks, and transit users. In some cases, because of right-of-way or other factors, not every user can be accommodated equally. So the goal is still to try to accommodate within each street, but to look at your overall network, the whole system, and think of it like this graphic shows in layers, that within the system, you want to provide good accessibility and mobility for autos, for trucks, transit, walkers, pedestrians and bicyclists, so that some streets may give more emphasis to one user over the other, but overall in the system, you've got a good, safe, convenient system for all the different users. So how has that changed our traditional thinking? Um, this is a slide out of the new Lansing Master Plan that is really, uh, Lansing's been one of the leaders in this new approach to transportation planning and looking at all the streets and their function. And a couple, I guess, tips on here of enhancing the traditional way of looking at transportation one is that while we are talking about travel along a corridor or a roadway, a key thing when you're talking about pedestrians and bicyclists is also getting across the roadway. And that's also important for transit users. A lot of bus stops are mid-block, and people, half the people getting on or off the bus probably are going to be wanting to cross the street, often at a, a place where there's not a traffic signal. 
I, I think the new philosophy really recognizes the importance of an interconnected system. Interconnected means you don't have gaps in the sidewalks or ba gaps in the in the bike system, um, and that streets are connected so that you have different choices of getting around in the community. Uh, the, the next, the third bullet on here, a range of facility types. Facility is kind of a jargony word, but that just means things like bike paths, and bike lanes, and sidewalks, and different types to accommodate different users. And another key change in the, the thinking of transportation is that the road design needs to consider the context. Context means the character of an area. Is this, Should this be a low volume street that's really appealing to pedestrians and bicyclists? Is this a street that's going to be high speed, higher volume? Is this going through a natural beauty area and so forth? So really designing the road to fit the context. And sometimes the design of the road might change as it goes through different character zones in a community. If we're talking about complete streets, why don't we walk and bike more? And when you poll people, they want to walk and bike more. But some of the reasons they give that they don't are that they just feel they're too exposed to high volumes or higher speed traffic. They don't feel comfortable. They don't feel the system is consistent or complete. You know, there's gaps in the sidewalks or, or they hit an area where they just can't cross the street. Um, transit is limited. That the transit doesn't appeal to their specific needs to go from point A to point B at the right times or the service isn't frequent enough. So what are some of the common misunderstandings of providing non-motorized facilities? And, and sometimes there's the question of, well, are bikes even allowed on the roads? And the rule of thumb is yes. The short answer is yes. Bikes, mopeds, et cetera, they have all the same rights and responsibilities as a motorist do with a few minor exceptions according to the Michigan Vehicle Code. But can they also be on the sidewalks? Well, yes, bikes are also allowed on the sidewalks, but if they're going to be passing a pedestrian, they're supposed to give an audible signal before they pass that uh, pedestrian according to the code. Now, there's a lot of flexibility uh, given to some of the local communities to control bicycling on sidewalks. We often see that restricted in downtown business areas. But the things we'll be talking about today here, these are all current best practices. And there's this concern of, well, we have an increased liability as a community if we allow bikes in the roadway and put things in bike lanes and crossing islands. And the short answer is no. What you really should be worried about is just kind of uh, ignoring the situation. So how do we minimize the risks for non-motorized facilities? Well, a lot of it's all to do with expectations. If a bicyclist in a roadway is going with the flow of traffic, they are visible where motorists are looking. They're kind of part of the traffic stream. When someone's turning in and out of driveways, it's a movement that they're looking for and a place that they're scanning. Uh, when someone is crossing a roadway that may be in a place that's not as expected, well, we need to draw attention to those areas. Uh, say, hey, look out. We have pedestrians crossing ahead. Also, where we expect to see a lot of bicycle and pedestrian travel, bringing the traffic flow down to a speed that's more compatible with bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, instead of trying to prohibit bicyclists and pedestrians, we need to accommodate them carefully. Why all this interest now in, in complete streets and bicycles and pedestrians? Well, this is not something that's happened overnight. There's really been a concerted move towards complete streets in the states here since the early 1990s. Um, and this has really kind of come from a recognition kind of collectively that what we have right now doesn't really meet all of our needs. We have a population that is aging. We are learning to provide independence for people with different abilities. Uh, we're looking at the implications of our choices on air quality. People are looking to create more sustainable communities. And how do we do this in a, a feasible economic framework. So the whole idea of complete streets is something that's building for quite some time. And we're really, I think, at a, a key time in this country of reworking our entire uh, transportation system. And it's because it has a lot of benefits. So the next series of slides really gets into a little bit more detail on what some of those benefits are. But part of the intent of these slides is to give you information that you can use to share with the public or people in your organization, or those that are skeptical of the complete streets process. 
And I'm just going to hit a few things on each slide. One is safety. I like the chart on the right that shows percentage of fatalities and crashes. And really what it shows, if you look at that, that bar chart, is if you're a pedestrian or a bicyclist and you're hit by a car going 40 miles per hour or, or higher, you only have a 15% chance of survival. But if that vehicle is going 20 miles an hour or less, you have a 95% chance of survival. And this is why sometimes when you're looking at streets and residential areas or we have a lot of pedestrian or bike activity, the design is not to try to eliminate the auto, but just to slow the vehicle down so it's more appropriate. The speed is more appropriate, harmonizes better with the pedestrian and bike activities. And, and there are a lot of different approaches that, that can increase safety. Some of those are listed on the, on the left of the slide. These pedestrian activated signals have been shown to reduce crashes, converting roads from four lane to three lane in appropriate locations that we'll talk about in module four can reduce crashes. Roundabouts can reduce the number and severity of crashes and designing the roadways to try to get the speeds to be appropriate for their context or surroundings can also decrease the number of collisions or the severity of collisions which reduces injuries and fatality. So safety is a key component of the complete streets approach. Another benefit is a improved public health. And I'm not going to go through all the various statistics. The, the charts on the left just show that if you do increase the amount of bicycling and walking in a community, you reduce obesity levels. And there's a lot of benefits to that, less heart disease, diabetes, more physical activity reduces stress. And a lot of statistics, some of which are shown on the right, about the uh, the benefits to business and industry by reducing sick leave and health care costs. So another benefit, and this works with, especially with getting school children involved in the complete streets process, is the cleaner environment. And it's really hard to get your arms around, you know, less emissions is cleaner air and so forth, but it's hard to really see a direct relationship sometimes for people. So I found that a simple way to do it is the second bullet, is that if you have one VMT is vehicle miles of travel, one mile driven in a car, you're going to produce about a pound of carbon. And a pound of carbon is about what's in that blue ball the woman is sitting on on the right of the slide. So every mile you drive is that much pollution into the air. Even with all our uh, improvements in automotive engineering and, and cleaner gas and so forth, when you add that up for each mile of travel, that ends up being more and more pollution. The next benefit is economic development and having livable places, something that we've talked about in Michigan now for the last few years with our economic duress and the loss of our younger um, professional populations moving to other states. And complete streets can be part of a system to be a catalyst for new development and redevelopment, creating more attractive and inviting streets. There have been a lot of studies uh, internationally and around the country showing if you transform some of these streets, create more walkable, uh, pedestrian and bike-oriented environments, you're going to have an increase in economic vitality. They've even shown, this is a, an older statistics, but still compelling, I think, from the Urban Land Institute, that home buyers are willing to pay more for homes in a pedestrian-friendly community instead of just a, a generic place without sidewalks. So I think the idea of complete streets, it can help improve our economic situation in Michigan. Another factor to consider is really looking at a fair system for people of all ages and abilities. Some of this Norm talked about, but we're looking at children, our growing senior population, people with disabilities, which um, some studies show that 20% of Americans have some type of disability that limits their daily activities. And these complete street systems are looking at making it easier for people with disabilities and our growing seniors and so forth to have choices, ways to get around. So they can still drive safely and conveniently, but if they want to walk or bike or use their wheelchair, that they have a way to get from point A to point B. Quality of life is really looking at some of those things we already factored. Uh, less congestion, less stress, more physical activity, more social interaction. All these things reflect quality of life. But I found one of the most interesting ways to get support from an audience for this is to say, how many of you would choose to live longer if you could? Most hands will go up, and then you'll know who's listening and who isn't. But basically, what this third bullet means is if you join a civic or social group, participate, if you have daily activity, it can cut your odds of dying next year in half. So that can be a real personal incentive for people to support complete streets and adding complete streets elements to a project. So there's a benefit of reducing the amount of time we spend in a car. And this is just a quick illustration of what we mean of a complete street. This is actually from a project we've done in Richmond, Indiana, 
just showing that this doesn't have to be expensive in a rebuild. It can be as simple as putting in some crosswalks and pavement striping, maybe those curb bump outs, adding trees. There's lots of little elements that can be combined to make the street still work safely for automobiles and for trucks, but to make it more comfortable for pedestrians and bicyclists to travel along and in particular to get across the street. So the goal of complete streets is to really balance the transportation needs. That says, well, how do we have a balanced quality of service so that it's not just a good system for automobiles and trucks, but also for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. So that means a new way of designing streets, a new way of redesigning intersections and timing intersections, and to consider as part of that the context of the area. So rather than the old way, I guess, of just looking at the lanes and what's going to be the lane width and number of lanes for cars, we start looking at, uh, well, should there be bike lanes or how do we accommodate bikes within this street or on a pillar or road and view that whole right away as public space to make it a place, to make it inviting for pedestrians, for bicyclists, but still safe and convenient for auto users. And another key component with complete streets is to look outside the right away to also look at the adjacent land uses and their form. Are they close to the road? Is there parking in the front or in the rear? What's the height of the building? And have a relationship between the form and design of the buildings and land use for the natural areas and the form and design and function of the street. And kind of expanding on what Brad was saying that, you know, when we look at the holistic aspect of the street, the, the landscaping, the sidewalks, the buildings, really the streets make up are, are the most defining characteristic of a place. Uh, think of as you visit an area, your impression of a community comes from the streets because these streets really are a community's single most important public space as far as the size, the visibility, and use. It is the public forum, so not just from a functional standpoint, but from how people see an area. Going beyond the physical aspect of the of, of roadway, uh, we have to kind of start thinking about complete streets as a cultural change, beyond just moving vehicles and freight, but also providing mobility and access and choices for all people. And it's creating a cultural change, and we need to integrate that into policies to provide safe and efficient transportation options. The policy programs for complete streets have really been coming in on the federal, state, and local levels. And we want to take a quick look at some of those. And in Michigan, we had a couple legislative complete street uh, victories last year. In August of 2010, two laws were changed. One is called Act 51. And this is the one that kind of deals with how mon gas tax money comes in and is distributed to the local communities. And that uh, law, the change that requires interjurisdictional consultation on non-motorized projects in five-year programs that one community, if it's a road that's under a jurisdiction of MDOT or Road Commission, can't just decide what it, that should be, that the communities need to kind of work together. And as we're accommodating bicycles and pedestrians, that we should be bringing in established best practices. Uh, that the there will be an advisory council that's already met a few times, and that council is to educate and advise the transportation stakeholders and the public on the development and the implementation and coordinating of the Complete Streets policy. And also how MDOT is going to implement Complete Streets as an agency. And also enabling interjurisdictional agreements for maintenance. So kind of a, a great change there. Now what does this mean? Well, communities should start thinking about in preparing a five-year plan for non-motorized facilities. What, it, what are your priorities? Uh, where you can get your most bang for the buck? So you can begin to coordinate with the other community, other road agencies as they are planning for facilities. Two acts were changed back in August of 2010. The second one was the Michigan Planning Act, and that is the act that describes the formation of a planning commission and says that a municipality needs to prepare a master plan and review or update the master plan every five years. So the changes in Act 33, or the Planning Act, was that it defines streets and expands it to include all legal users. Basically, in the master plan, the community master plan, streets are supposed to consider all ways of getting around walking, biking, cars and trucks and transit. It also says that when you're doing a transportation 
recommendations that they need to be appropriate to their context or the characteristics of the area, and that it also specifies how a community is to coordinate and cooperate with the Michigan Department of Transportation and the Road Commission uh, if you've got a state trunk line or um, you're a township, for example, working with the Road Commission, so that there's collaboration between the transportation agency and the community. So what, is, what are the implications of that change in the planning law? Well, first of all, it's not a mandate. Um, while a master plan is required to be looked at every five years, there are still some communities in Michigan that don't have one. But it does encourage you to include transportation as part of the master plan and to look at all these different modes of transportation. And if you do have a master plan, it does require that, that there be a transportation component. And the Michigan law already requires coordination with neighboring communities and road agencies. And that's just specified a little bit more elaborately now to make sure that a, a bordering community, for example, has the same long-range plan for a border street. Um, because many of these major corridors travel from community to community and that there's some consistency in the planning and design of, along that corridor. There are now 48 resolutions. Communities and counties, organizations in Michigan have passed a complete streets resolution. We have eight communities in Michigan that have a complete streets ordinance that basically says streets shall be designed. The law of this community is to consider complete streets. So a resolution is kind of um, a philosophy or a policy an ordinance is putting into legal effect. So that first P is building support, but working with existing relationships of all the different providers. It's important to have a identify a leader and agree on roles and responsibilities and get a lot of people on board. On board. Um, being inclusive and knowing who are the key people to involve, especially who are the funders, who design who are the people that design or agencies that design the transportation system and who has the funding to make some of these changes. The second P is educate and train. Use a wide range of, of media and outreach, websites and printed media. We've had a lot of publicity in some of the major newspapers in Michigan in the last couple of years on complete streets. And, well, I'm a planner, so how do you incorporate complete streets into local plans and policies? On the left here, there are all types of different plans that are done at different levels of government. The master plan or comprehensive plans. Many neighborhoods uh, have a legacy of creating neighborhood plans. Like in Kalamazoo, many of the neighborhoods have their own neighborhood plan. Um, a growing number of communities are having a separate non-motorized plan. You've got downtown development authorities and corridor improvement authorities that have a tax increment financing plan that can implement these things. So building this philosophy and these ideas into the community plans is one of the P's. And then as you work your way through the process to make sure that your local regulations are supporting complete streets and not an obstacle. So changes to your zoning ordinance, your sidewalk construction or maintenance ordinance, standards for reviewing design of site plans and new development, street design and subdivision regulations for pathways and, and streets and so forth. So you've got the planning side, but then you've got to turn it into design and regulation. And it's important to know the different levels of planning in your community or organization or where you're, you're working. Some of these we mentioned, comprehensive plans and the MPO plans. Um, corridor plans or sub area plans are plans for a particular street that often have in the past have been funded by the counties or by the Michigan Department of Transportation. A sub area plan might be a downtown plan or a special business district plan. And again, transit agencies often have a long range plan too that's looking at changing patterns, where should we provide bus service? And that transit plan should be coordinated with the community's plans and plans of other organizations. Rather than a traffic-oriented level of service, you might look at a multimodal quality of service. And this just shows simplistically how that works. On the left is an automobile level of service. You might recall I mentioned A means no delay, and F is sort of long delay sitting through multiple red lights. Um, and the tr typical standard is a C or D for a, a, a typical street in Michigan. For pedestrian quality of service, it means you've got a good network of sidewalks, you've got some frequent opportunities to cross, and you've got a good sidewalk environment that it doesn't feel hostile. You're not up right next to uh, high volumes of rapidly moving vehicles. Pulling these things together, when you look at a flexible street design, you start out looking broadly at the whole network. Are there, is there a connected street system, the different hierarchy of streets, what's the function of each road for traffic? for pedestrians, for bicyclists, transit users, where your truck routes, and so forth. 
then you kind of zoom down into the district level and say, okay, how can we make maybe in this quarter mile, half mile zone, how can we make it more convenient to walk and bike? Because that, again, is, you know, that 65% of the people on those short trips are driving. So how do we get more of them to walk or to bike ride? And look at the character of the area. What are the routes that people might take? And then you get down to the detail of an intersection. What are the small scale things we can do here to improve, um, it might be crosswalks or changes in signal timing or reducing the number of lanes or reducing the lane width so you can add in bike lanes or widen the sidewalks, but make that design work. And that's where you would evaluate it, not just for an automotive level of service, but for a multimodal level of service. How well does this intersection work for cars and trucks, but also pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users? I mentioned that as you go through different zones of a community or a county or across the state, the design of the roadway and what's appropriate in terms of pedestrians and bicycle and transit might vary as you go from an urban, more dense area out to the rural area. And so this slide is just showing some of the factors that you consider when we talk about context or character. And these are just a couple of slides to show examples. This would be a variation of a of a street from urban to suburban to rural. So what are some of the walk-bike friendly principles? Some things you might consider if you're trying to be more walk and bike friendly is uh, typically buildings closer to the street, uh, eliminating driveway conflicts, sometimes yeah. called access management, to eliminate driveway conflicts makes the road function better for cars, but also eliminates conflicts for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, making, again, sure that you're paying attention to getting across the street, not just along the street. A lot of the projects I work on, people say, well, let's provide more transit. But really, to make transit work, you've got to have a couple of factors in your favor. One is you've got to have enough density, population, employment density to make transit viable and more cost effective. But you also need a good pedestrian network, a way for people to walk from their house or to the store to and from the bus stop. And also, a problem we have a lot in Michigan is the bus stop is at a location pretty remote from a signalized intersection. So people either have to walk a long distance out of their way or more likely are going to run across the street where people aren't expecting them to go to or from the bus stop. So linking in your pedestrian planning with your transit planning is really important. Also looking at amenities like uh, bus shelters and providing good information to transit users on the frequency of bus and so forth. And even complete streets could involve park and ride that we've got in a suburban area. You've got larger parking lots or MDOT park and ride. And let people still drive to that location, but encourage them to then take transit from the park and ride to their destination. So if you pull those things together, some common design elements are to have sidewalks, provide some level of, of bike facility, bike lanes, and uh, but just a lot of pretty straightforward, intuitive design elements that you can do to make intersections and streets more accommodating and safe for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. This is sort of a simple intersection provided a drawing provided by Renaissance Planning Group out of Virginia and just looks at a typical rural intersection to show you th some pretty simple things you can do to make this intersection um, more of a complete street, more accommodating to pedestrians and bicyclists, like removing some of the wider driveways, makes the, the intersection a little bit cleaner. Then maybe you add in pedestrian crosswalks and uh, lane markings and sort of identifies or notifies the motorist that, hey, there might be a pedestrian crossing here.